back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Life in the Law. It's our Life in the Law series, and we're honored this morning uh, to have Chief Justice Mark Rector of the Hawaii Supreme Court with us uh, to talk to us how, about how the coronavirus has affected our judiciary. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, CJ. I really appreciate you being here. Jay, thank you for having me, and thank you uh, to Think Tech for uh, continuing to inform our community during this uh, time of crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we consider it a very important mission of ours. So um, talking about government in general, we know how, how busy you must be because uh, you, know, you must be in the same place about watching the branches of government function, even in a time of crisis, watching the judiciary, uh, helping the judiciary through the crisis. Um, we, we need government now, maybe more than ever. We need our courts. Um, we need branch, all the branches of government. Regrettably, we don't have the legislature functioning um, but at least we have the judiciary function. I know how hard you work to make, make that happen. We need judicial oversight. We need to, you know, uh, uh, we need to lubricate the wheels of justice. So disputes and the implementation of statutes, however they were arrived at, you know, can be overseen and, uh, and handled by the judiciary. Very important that you continue to function. My, my uh, understanding is much of the bar is working, much of the bench is working, and you're working harder than anyone. <laughs> so, no, no, no. Really, really appreciate it's that. It's not harder than the folks on the front lines, but uh, of the healthcare industry. But you know, we well. First of all, thanks for having me on, Jay. I mean, I think you know we face the the the, the, the balancing between uh, wanting to protect the health and safety of everyone who comes into our courthouses, our staff, our judges, and the public, uh, with also continuing to operate and do business. So that's really been the focus of our efforts uh, over this last six weeks is to strike that balance, uh, to figure out ways in which uh, we can, uh, to the maximum extent possible, uh, keep people out of our courthouses but continue to operate. And, and whether that's doing hearings remotely, um, deciding motions based on, on just paper submissions from the parties, or written submissions as opposed to having oral arguments, uh, or uh, restricting access to the courthouses to people who are only there for very specific reasons, um, from the public side, and then um, internally trying to have as many folks as possible set up to work remotely so we're minimizing the number of people who are in our courthouses each day. But we, uh, we, we need to be open. We need to be doing the public's work uh, and ensuring the due process is maintained during the crisis. But we also need to do our part uh, to make sure that we're doing everything possible uh, to maintain uh, the health and safety of everyone who comes in contact with the judicial system. Well, wow. Uh, let me unpack some of that a little bit. Uh, for example, I mean, we have to maintain public confidence in the, in the system, and that I guess that happens at, at every level. Um, but you have, for example, right now you have um, the police are issuing citations and tickets. Uh, in a case or two, they made an arrest uh, for violation of the quarantine and, and orders issued by the, by the governor. Um, is that in the pipeline? Is there, is there a way to handle that, or is that going to be something that just gets uh, delayed until we find a better time. Well, I think you know what we what we've done on the criminal side uh, of the house is when we have the real focus is on uh, people who are in custody. So if someone uh, is arrested and um, is not able to post bail, or even if they do post bail, there's a series of uh, constitutional and statutory protections that require. Uh, action by the courts in a relatively short time frame. And so what we've tried to do uh, is uh, to maintain that those core, um, those core uh, criminal proceedings and try to do them as much as possible um, by uh, video. So if we have somebody who's, for example, being held in custody at OCCC, uh, Oahu Community Correctional Center, uh, we have um, video slots available uh, on a, several days of the week. And, and I gotta say that the Department of Public Safety has worked with us to increase the amount of time we have uh, to be able to have defendants um, appearing by video uh, from OCCC with the lawyers in, court, in courtrooms here in Honolulu. And if we're able to socially distance in the courtroom uh, and to be able to conduct those proceedings. So uh, for folks, you know, proceedings when we have folks who are not in custody, uh, generally, we've tried to um, continue those proceedings uh, into um, at least in, into um, 
at the end of April to May. And now, of course, that was our initial order, was to uh, basically continue matters until uh, after April 30th. And of course, as we start to near that deadline, we're going to have to uh, reassess uh, what we're going to do on a longer term basis. And uh, are we going to continue operating the same way? Are we going to change things up a little bit? Um, what changes can we make based on the experience we have? So I think mm, it yeah. really, in any particular case, depends on the nature of the case. And, you know, particularly in the, for criminal cases, is somebody in custody? Um, and, um, and then, of course, there's a very different approach in civil cases. But even there, realizing there's certain core kinds of cases that have to be adjudicated, uh, even in this environment, like restraining order cases. So if somebody's at risk from violence, uh, that's not something we can put off for a month. That's something that has to be adjudicated, hopefully to the maximum extent possible, uh, online or, or in a remote way. But if not, sometimes we do have to do it in person proceedings. Well, um, you know, you talk about uh, the, the criminal process. That there have been issues raised uh, on whether the the, uh, the prisoners uh, in uh, Oahu Community Corrections Center should be released because of coronavirus. Um, by the ACLU and others, uh, and this is not only uh, in Hawaii, you hear this issue being raised on the mainland as well. Do you have any thoughts about it? Can you speak about it? Uh, where does it fit? Well, I'm, you know, we do have a pending case in front of us, and again, under our code of conduct, I can't comment on a matter that's pending. So, um, you know, it's, as, it, it, it's out there that we, there's a special master has been appointed, uh, Judge Dan Foley, who will be reporting to the court. That's the status of the case right now, and then um, beyond that, I really can't comment on the issues that that case has raised. I can say that uh, even before that petition was filed, uh, we had done a lot of um, work on the county level, trying to work both with the police, prosecutors, and public safety to work through the sort of myriad issues that come up on a day-to-day -day basis of, um, you know, should this particular person be brought to the courthouse? Um, should we be executing this bench warrant on someone who um, failed to appear for a traffic violation? Do we want that person in the system right now? Uh, how do we go about um, having the judges come uh, engage with the defendant? Um, is that something we can do by video? Is it, uh, are there arrangements we can make to uh, maintain social distance? So, it, it, across the state, we had uh, have been and continue to engage uh, on a daily basis with um, you know law enforcement, with public safety, the public safety department, police, prosecutors, and public defenders to try to uh, work through a lot of the practical issues that come up. But the case, the matter itself, is now the subject of a petition, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm just not I'm not able to comment because oh, sure. it's really something we have sure. to decide on the record. Now, what about access? You know, um, access is a you know big part of the American system. The public should have access. Uh, the courts uh, should be open uh, to the public, but you really can't do that. I mean, you know, uh, talking about the uh, micro uh, work by the Japanese uh, science community <laughs> on uh, micro uh, droplets, uh, which are which are emitted uh, when you just speak in, in a conversation. They hang in the air. This is probably a big reason why uh, coronavirus is so contagious. So if you let people in, you're going to have micro droplets for sure, and you're going to have contagion. How do you handle that? How have you handled that? <laughs> well, a couple of ways. So you know, I think one critical, um, you know, for one critical step we took, I think it was around March uh, 20th, when we basically closed our courthouses uh, for all but official business. And so what I mean, and and and. That order said the folks who could be in the court uh, courthouse building were relatively. Uh, Specific people who had a specific role in the proceeding: uh, attorney, a party, translator, uh, domestic violence advocates. There were there were very specific categories that we identified, and the order said, you know, enter the building, go to the proceeding, turn around, and come back. And then the direction was to maintain social distance uh, in the courtrooms as much as possible. And I think we tried uh, we tried very hard to maintain that. And, and then. Uh, to clean, uh, you know, intensively those areas where folks come in and come into public contact. But you know, those, those, so those are that that small category of matters that are still being conducted with people physically coming in. But we tried to uh, minimize them uh, to the greatest extent possible. We tried to find other ways to resolve those cases without having people come in. Uh, and then when they do come in, we, we basically just have folks who are there for that very limited purpose. Uh, and 
and then are asked to leave the courthouse afterwards. And, you know, I, I would view, to be clear, uh, the media uh, wanting to cover an event and, and that being obviously a legitimate reason for someone to be in the courthouse. What about jury trials? Um, you know, uh, it's hard to do that by remote. Um, and it's, it's hard to uh, have a jury of, uh, of 12 sit in a, in a regular jury box uh, where you can't be six feet apart. Uh, how, how can you handle, how are you handling jury trials? You know, it's a great question. That was, uh, you know, one of the, uh, when I entered an order on March 16th that basically uh, set the framework for what we're doing in the judiciary in terms of how to handle this crisis and, um, you know, did I did sort of the broad parameters of what we were going to do. And one of the things, uh, one of those was to uh, continue jury trials or, uh, until after April 30th. That was uh, back in mid-March, and now we're going to have to reassess that as April 30th nears. But it was apparent, although you know, we had tried uh, to figure out ways in which we could minimize the risk. Um, you know, we initially were looking at, you know, uh, strong policies for folks who, you uh, had traveled to particular places, might have been, um, had other risk factors, and then allowed uh, potential jurors, if they were in the high risk categories, to uh, ask for excuses based on those um, uh, risk categories without having to come to the building. But eventually, uh, we, we reached the conclusion that uh, we simply had to um, stop bringing people together in this way. Because, you know, when you, when you create a jury, you need a lot more than just the 12 people plus the alternates who are on the jury in the pool and to bring them together for jury selection. And so we, as I believe every other um, state and federal jurisdiction across the country, um, suspended jury trials during this period of time. And I think, uh, you know, we are actively trying, thinking through um, what might we do or how might we bring back uh, jury trials um, going forward. I think. Again, it's a real challenge because it is uh, typically a face-to-face. -face. People are in a room. Uh, you could try to socially distance, and, and certainly those will be things that we'll think about. Uh, but you know, typically you do have a lot of folks in a in a relatively small space, and so we have a lot to work through. I think before we're going to be ready to bring uh, people together in that way. Again. Yeah, it is a kind of uncomfortable in the sense that the American jurisprudence uh, is based on. <clears throat> looking the witness in the eye, um, seeing uh, the sweat on his brow or her brow, <laughs> and try to figure out if he's telling the truth and making a, a determination of fact on that. So, you know, we have to preserve that. We're going to preserve the system. Um, one other thing I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, CJ, is uh, we, have, we have special situations now, civil situations. We have situations involving businesses that can't pay the bills, um, especially the rent or mortgages or loans. Uh, we have situations where, where people can't pay the rent uh, for their homes. Um, we have all kinds of, you know, breakaway type civil situations. And I, I recall that um, you've, you've issued some orders dealing with that and, and uh, delaying, for example, evictions. What have you done and how has it worked? Well, I think we've, you know, uh, on, on foreclosures and evictions, uh, those proceedings are among the ones that have been uh, continued uh, until after April 30th. So, again, we're going to have to assess everything that we did in that initial order back on March 16th to determine how we want to uh, how we want to proceed going forward. But um, I think there are, you know, we get, we get questions sometimes about in the landlord-tenant context, uh, well, what if there's a, what if there are, um, you know, there's, there's conduct that's, that's um, threatening or, or that might um, affect public health and safety. And, you know, the restraining order uh, mechanism is still available. So there are still avenues um, for people to proceed uh, in that context. Uh, but the, the, the proceedings for eviction and the proceedings for foreclosure were among those that uh, we decided, again, because they tend to be uh, bring a lot of folks in or bring people together. Uh, in the building, uh, those were some of the proceedings that we um, uh, continued. Although, in that, you know, in every instance, the judge has the ability to say uh, a particular matter is urgent and needs to be resolved uh, immediately. That judges still retain that power, and so uh, that's the balance we've tried to strike in that mm -hmm. area. And um, 
um, again, we uh, you know we're, we're, we need to uh, look ahead uh, when we get to the end of the month and decide how we want to proceed, and we're going to try to use the best evidence that we have in terms of uh, how long this crisis is going to continue and figure out the right path forward and really are, are listening very carefully uh, to our judges out in the field. Um, you know, and we have, I, I have to emphasize, we've heard the bar, uh, Hawaii State Bar Association and its members have been extraordinarily helpful both in terms of uh, us being able to share information about what we're doing uh, in the courts uh, with members of the bar and also being able to hear from members of the bar um, the challenges they're facing in being able to practice in this, uh, in this environment and ideas for what we might be able to do uh, to ensure that um, you know, the legal system can continue to operate both in the civil and criminal arena. So uh, you know, my hat's off to uh, Greg Fry, the president of um, Hawaii State Bar Association, Pat Malshimizu, because they really have helped us uh, get out the word about what we're doing. And you know, I realize what a lot of, uh, you know, I set that framework for how we're going to, in essence, reschedule and move to a, 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 a world that's you know, as, le as minimally in-person as possible. But I left to each uh, chief judge in each circuit the um, opportunity and responsibility to define how that was going to take place in their individual circuits. So each circuit chief judge issued a series of orders addressing specific courts, civil, criminal, family, uh, in their respective circuits, and uh, we realized there was a lot out there, so we, we, we put it together on our website in one place where people can find it, because we want to be sure folks, uh, lawyers and others who have to navigate the system can understand what's up and what's running and what's not right now. What's the uh, name of the website, CJ? So if you go to the Hawaii State Judiciary, if you Google Hawaii State Judiciary, you go to our website, there's a big banner on the top that says COVID-19. You go there, and it's uh, all of the all of the orders, starting with my statewide orders, and then each of the circuit orders is is set forth there. And um, again, the big ones for us statewide were the the, the, the order I issued on March 16th that set the framework for basically uh, moving us uh, to uh, 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 non-in-person hearings, rescheduling a number of matters uh, until April 30th, and then uh, a couple days later, uh, shutting the courthouses except to official business. Then we suspended a, a number of filing deadlines for about two weeks um, and that was just to ensure that people who might not have had access to a computer or uh, might have, you know, for whatever reason, uh, might have been exposed, you know, put, put at risk of exposure if they had to, you know, come into a, a, an office and then come to our building to file. We wanted to give them some relief, so for about a two-week period, uh, we, I suspended filing deadlines in the in the trial courts and the appellate courts. Uh, that expired uh, on Friday, and based on the feedback I've gotten, which is it seems like people have settled in and are now able to work in this environment, I didn't extend it. So we're back to um, the deadlines that existed in cases you know, that have been set forth in all of our cases for people to file. What about the uh, those uh, young young people who are taking the bar exam? We're trying. What's the status there? So that was uh, we did. We took the my court, which uh, is in charge of the um, the licensure process, working with the board of bar examiners. Um, uh, we did two things. First, um, we um, e extended the bar. So there's going to be a bar exam at the end of July. We've announced that we're going to reschedule it, probably for a date in September, and then we. Um, extended the application deadline um, for that bar by another month. So we tried to give, again, relief to folks who um, might not have been able to complete their um, applications on time. That, that deadline uh, was April 1st, and we were, you know, I know there, there's a lot that goes into applying to become a lawyer, and again, some of that might bring us out to, um, bring us out to uh, people out into the community and we wanted to give them another month to apply and then we just you know a, along with about a number of other jurisdictions made the judgment uh that we would uh, reschedule the bar rather than trying to bring again bring all of those folks together in one place uh in july and uh again it's something that people need to plan for they need to plan to travel if they're not here in hawaii so those are the two steps we took and i have I found our, our website address, www.courts.state.hi.us. So, but again, if you just Google Hawaii Judiciary, you'll find it. Okay. 
Well, it sounds like, uh, you know, you, you really um, got your arms around it. And furthermore, that it's essentially working for now. Um, but that your, your approach is to take a look at it. I hate to use this term, take its temperature, as it were. <laughs> and tune it, up, tune it up as you go forward, which is really great. So at this point where there's so much discombobulation, confusion, misinformation, it sounds like the Hawaii State Judiciary really has things worked out, at least for the moment. Well, you know, I, I got to say our, our and I, I really have to, two things I have to say, our, our staff and judges have been amazing. And, you know, we have people, our facility staff, you know, are, are, are keeping these buildings clean. The security folks are, are, you know, navigating the guidelines that we put out for who can come in and who can't come into the building. Um, we have folks who are, you know, coming in and, and, and engaging in our buildings. We have others who are working very, very hard from home and, uh, you know, people have been incredible in trying to, you know, meet the challenges of this situation. And then I, I really have to um, shout out to a lot of our partners in the community. Um, you know, the Department of Health has been very helpful to us uh, as we've had specific situations arise, giving us guidance about how to deal with them. Uh, you know, the legislature was very supportive uh, while they were still in session you know, for, in terms of our needs. Uh, as I said, the bar has been wonderful, and um, you know we've we've been able to again working with law enforcement and others uh, to address some of the day-to-day -day issues that come up. And then nationally, um, you know we've engaged. Just yesterday, uh, there was a, a national web broadcast of um, judges from across the country uh, talking about ways to to do more work remotely, which is you know an example of again. Uh, judiciary, judges, and staff coming together, you know, both here in Hawaii on the local level, at the state level, and then across our country uh, to be sure we serve the public, uh, but maintain public health and safety in this crisis. Yeah. And by the way, uh, remote remote is something that the press has addressed and that we have addressed, and uh, uh, it works really swell. I mean, it's not only think tech, it's CNN, MSNBC. Almost all the guests these days are uh, connected remotely. But let me, let, me, let me point this out, though. We're in a dynamic, and things are changing. We haven't reached the apex yet. There will be more cases, more deaths, more issues. Uh, and, you know, you can imagine, I'm sure you do imagine, there will be disputes about this. There will be legal issues that need to be resolved. Just a, a few that come to mind. You know, one is uh, there was an article about uh, whether, in, whether the standard form um, insurance, uh, business insurance, covers business interruption in the context of, of a pandemic. Um, that was in the, in, the, in the paper today. Policies uh, have to be developed. Um, we have business failures, breaches of contracts, failure of supply lines. All these issues are going to come up. There'll be a lot of claims. Uh, we have not decided as a matter of public policy, a matter of law, exactly where the burden should fall. Um, is this an act of God? Uh, suppose the contract talks about act of God, but they didn't, don't talk about epidemics. Uh, and thankfully, a, a lot of them do talk about it and, you know, handle that issue going forward. But um, I suspect you're going to be awash in, you, when I say you, I mean the judiciary, the, the, the justice system, the civil justice system, uh, are going to be awash in new issues of every kind and nature. I'm not sure when this tidal wave is going to start. Maybe, maybe it's already starting. Uh, although you, you, you probably can't handle it right away. But how do you see that? You must think about that at 3 in the morning, CJ. Uh, there's going to be all kinds of new issues that are arising around us, though. You know, I think it, 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 you know, that's, that's, what, that's how the law works. You know, situations arise, and then um, that's why we have courts, you know, so that, that the parties and their lawyers can come in and make arguments to our judges, and we can, you know, listen and decide, make the right call based on what the record and the evidence is. So, you know, whether that's an insurance policy or a contract or a statute, that's that's kind of that's, that's what we do, and that's why, um, you know, it's so important for us to continue to provide this fair uh, forum with due process for all. And you know, those those, those issues will arise, um, and we will deal with them in due course. You know, and so, uh, and I'm confident we will be able to do that. And um, I'm sure there'll be some things we haven't seen before, but you know, some of these issues have arisen in other contexts. You know, with the um, eruption on the Big Island, there were some you know tough insurance coverage issues that arose, and uh, uh, folks were able to address them. And uh, I'm sure there'll be issues that come up here as well, but I, I'm confident we'll be able to 
address them and resolve them in a way that's fair. We'll listen to everyone and make the right, make the call that we think is right based on the record. Well, you remember what George Washington said. He said the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the true administration of justice is the firmest pillar of government. And I, with you, I am confident that you will be able to handle this. Um, but let's move on to, um, you know, planning for the future, because, uh, you know, every every crisis is an opportunity to learn and develop better plans going forward. And you must be thinking about that, too. Uh, you must be thinking about, you know, having the resources, um, having the technology, uh, having the systems uh, that would be able to better deal with another crisis like this. And, and P.S., the scientific community has made it clear that the coronavirus virus is just one virus. There are others in the pipeline that we will see later. That's the human condition. Um, so this was a bad one, it has been and is a bad one, but there'll be others and they could be even more you know, damaging. So question is uh, planning going forward, thinking about how you would you know, change the system to make it more resilient in the, in the face of other crises in the future. Have you thought about that? And what, what are your reactions um, you know, to plan? Well, for sure. And, you know, just to be clear, we had planned, uh, you know, ex extensively for uh, we, for civil defense emergencies, including pandemics. We've had some training for our judges and, uh, you know, we've had uh, folks who've gone and participated in, you know, tabletop exercises on pandemics. So it's something we, we, we certainly have thought about, although, you know, we've put a lot of emphasis into uh, you know, review. You know, considering, for example, uh, the framework that would apply uh, for mandatory quarantine if somebody didn't want to go into quarantine. That's not, in, in fact, something that's really, to my knowledge, been uh, that much of an issue now in terms of of, of, of of proceedings to actually impose quarantine on folks. Um, so, you know, some of the things that you sort of anticipate might be. Uh, what we spend a lot of time on, in fact, um, are not the things that we've spent a lot of time on. We're, we're focused, you know, of course, because of the nature of, of this pandemic, on how do you do the business of the court uh, without having folks come into the courthouse to the, to the maximum extent possible, both in terms of our own staff and in terms of the public parties and lawyers. And, you know, so those lessons, I think, are uh, ones and the adaptions we've been making uh, to that situation, I think, will carry us forward. So, using technology more effectively to enable people to work remotely, I think, uh, on our side, uh, will be important. And also, uh, learning ways to use technology uh, to be able to uh, engage uh, court proceedings, the public, uh, learning lessons about how technology might be used in, for example, depositions in ways that uh, it hasn't been used so far. Uh, although our rules anticipate that you could have depositions by um, electronic, you know, by electronic means, you know, are those rules uh, adequate to meet the task that we have now? So there's a lot of lessons to be learned, and we're learning them. We're learning them fast, and we'll keep trying to learn them and and, and be and be ready to uh, whenever we need that, whenever we need that information again. What will it cost money? Would you seek additional resources to be better prepared for the next one? Would you seek additional personnel or space for that? You know, I think those are all things we'd want to sort sort through. I mean, obviously, just having you know the resources to be able to uh, you know purchase the supplies we need to keep our buildings clean, laptops to be able to um, you know have people work from home. Uh, you know, if we need to upgrade our video equipment or audio equipment, those are all things that we'll be thinking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the legislature certainly had expressed before they uh, went out of session had express the willingness to entertain um, those kinds of requests if we need them. And so we'll we'll see what our needs are going forward. But right now, um, you know, we're taking the resources we have and using them to the best of our ability. You know, uh, one thing you've mentioned a couple of times during this discussion is, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, the benefits of having remote communication like we're having now and, uh, of course, with laptops and the like in terms of improving the equipment, software, what have you. <clears throat> but I wonder if, is, if, if you see a, a whole change in the system emerging out of this. In other words, uh, finding more and more opportunities for remote connection within the judicial system and making it thus more, more resilient and more efficient, even in, in times of uh, non-virus. Non uh, is, this, is this a possibility? I, I certainly think we're going to, you know, we're, we're, 
we're all becoming more adept at using uh, type, new types of technology. And, you know, I think we had, you know, we the technologies we had in place, you know, in our courtrooms are typically audio uh, technology and then tied into uh, a recording system in the courtroom. So if, if as we explore uh, new means or uh, new opportunities, um, I'm sure we'll learn from that. And, you know, that may make us uh, more flexible uh, going forward. But, you know, the, the, there are certain kind of core um, needs that we have. You know, one is for the trial judges to be able to create a record, you know, which is um, something that the appellate court can look at and understand what happened and then be able to um, uh, determine, you know, if there's a challenge to what took place in the trial court, have a clear understanding of what took place. So whatever we do, there's some of those uh, core needs that we still have to be sure that we address. But, you know, we're we're trying every day to learn and, and identify opportunities uh, for how we can be flexible and how we can respond more effectively. And I'm sure all those lessons will carry on into the future. You know, CJ, there's a lot of people out there who worry about the future. <clears throat> we took a, a poll, a survey on our website, you know, we got some answers back about how people are not necessarily optimistic about the future. This, this has scared them big time. They've never seen anything like this. In fact, nobody I know has seen anything like this. <laughs> even, even the scientists have not seen anything like this. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, and, and really it's a test in a, in, a, in a way, isn't it? It's a test of government. Uh, it's a test of all the branches of government and certainly a test of ju the judicial system. And I wonder if you could talk to people for a minute in closing, we don't have more time, but in closing to say, what, you know, what is your message to them about the future? about the future of our system, our democracy, our judiciary, uh, and you know the basic principles that have held this country together for all these years. Well, I think people absolutely should be confident. You know, these are terribly challenging times. There are heartbreaking things happening around the country and in our own community that, you know, cause us to pause each day and, 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 and you know, cause us to have, you know, dark moments. I think every one of us has those moments. But, you know, the fundamental truth is our system is strong. The folks we have who are working in our government are committed uh, to providing those services, maintaining the basic uh, principles of our democracy, you know, equal justice before the law and due process, and to ensure that people have this forum to resolve their disputes, uh, whatever challenges we're facing. And so I think people should feel confident in the future that our um, institutions of government uh, we'll be up to this challenge. You know, we're not going to get everything right necessarily the first time, but we're going to learn. We're going to work our hearts out to, to, to figure out the best way to do it. And we're going to learn from what happens and get better and better and better. And uh, the commitment of our people uh, is unwavering within the institution. And people should be confident that we're going to be able to uh, continue to deliver on the promise of uh, justice for all and due process that are the bedrock of our democracy. Uh, C.J. Mark Reckonwald, thank you so much for coming down with us and for talking to us uh, by remote about these really critical issues in our, in our community and our democracy. Thank you so much. And thank you for all you're doing. And I hope we can circle back and check back with you in a month or two to see how it's going. Absolutely. And, you know, again, one last shout out to the folks on the front line who are working day in and day out here in our organization and across the state, health care providers, public safety folks across the state who are uh, just working tirelessly to keep our community safe. So thanks to them, and thank you, Jay, for letting me come on and speak to, your, uh, to all your uh, listeners and followers. And I appreciate what you're doing, keeping the free flow of information in these difficult times. Thank you, CJ. CJ Mark Rechtenwald, aloha and stay safe. Aloha. You too, Jay.